Tyler, you may be seated. Before we get into the message this morning, just want to remind you, you have three seat back cards in front of you, each designed for a particular need. So if you have a prayer concern or a question or want to take a next step, those cards are for you. If you would take those cards to the connection point, we'd love to respond uh, to whatever need you might have. Verse 13 in that passage, then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? What is his name? You have a name. I have a name. All God's children have names. Our names are important to us. On the count of three, I want all of us to say our name out loud. Here we go. One, two, three. Tim. Tim, here's the thing. Moses doesn't say, what is your name? What is your name? In the Hebrew language, and this is common among all languages, but in the Hebrew language, there is no equivalent to the English, uh, to the English phrase, what is your name? It literally means, who is your name? The Hebrew is saying, who is your name? Or what is the meaning or the significance of your name? Moses is simply asking, who are you? Who, who are you? Who are, who are you? Uh, and there are different words uh, for God in this text. Elohim, which is the title for God, is found in this text. And this is the name that all the Israelites were familiar with. Uh, Genesis 1.1, uh, in the beginning, what? Everybody say it. In the beginning, God. God. That is the word Elohim. Elohim. This is a title uh, for God. Elohim is, the mo is most often translated God in the Old Testament, and it is not a name for God as much as it is a title for God. It is a label. Uh, some of you call me pastor. That is not wrong to do so, but it is not my name. It is my title. Titles are formal. Names are personal. So at the beginning of the Bible, it informs us that there is a God, an Elohim, who spoke the universe into existence. But at that point, that's, that's all we know. There is Elohim. Now here in this text, Exodus chapter 3, God himself discloses his personal name. Now before we get to that, think of this. In ancient cultures, names meant more than they do today. Um, we choose names many times because we just like the sound of them, uh, or they're currently pop popular uh, in our culture, or we do try to honor people that we know and love. My name is after a relative of mine in the family. In the Bible, a name was more than a label or a physical identifier. It was descriptive. Your name didn't just identify you. It was your identity. Think of Jacob in the Old Testament in the story of Genesis his name means deceiver, and this is exactly who he was. He cheated his brother, he lied to his father, he manipulated his father-in-law, he played favorites between his wives and children, and then one night he wrestles with God and gets a new name. God calls him Israel, which means one who fights or wrestles with God. And so Jacob not only receives a new name, he receives a new identity, a new purpose in life with this new name. So for the next seven weeks, uh, we are going to ask of Jesus what Moses asked of God. Who are you? What is the significance of your name? It's important to understand who Jesus is. Uh, we just completed the series Practicing the Way of Jesus, and I think it's imperative that we know the Jesus whose way we are practicing. So toward the end of his ministry in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus turns to his disciples and asks a question, who do people say that I am? And there was a lot of confusion. Elijah, John the Baptist, one of the prophets, it hasn't changed. Who is Jesus? A.W. Tozer wrote this, what comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image. Note that. It is a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. Put another way, the most important question you can ask in your life is who is God? And it's important that you get that question right. It's important that you get that question right because the answer to that question will shape you. For example, if you think of God as angry and manipulating and thinks that everything you do is wrong, then that's going to influence how you live your life or how you view him or at best give you criteria by which you can judge everybody around you. Or if you think of God as a you know, progressive, educated grandfather who thinks everything you do is delightful, then he will be nothing more than a life coach 
to improve your image and bolster your self-esteem and feed your narcissism. Uh, Scott McKnight is a New Testament theologian, author, and professor at Northern Seminary, and he teaches a course on Jesus, and at the beginning of every semester, uh, he passes out two different surveys to his class. The first one, asking students about themselves. Uh, What do you like? What do you dislike? Extroverted, introverted, passive, aggressive? What are your values? That sort of thing. Who are you? They fill that out. They turn it in. And then they pick up a second set of questions, which is all about Jesus. Who is Jesus? What is Jesus like? What does Jesus like? And so on. What he has found is that 90% of the time, the answers to both surveys are exactly the same. What does that mean? Well, it was either Rousseau or Voltaire uh, who first said, God created man in his own image, and man, being a gentleman, has returned the favor. Friends, there is this natural bent, as A.W. Tozer said, there is this bent in all of us to think of God like us, to turn the God we believe in into a God that believes like us. I mean, it is so convenient that we have a God that hates the same people we do, loves the same people we do, who voted for the same person that we voted for, right? He is passionate about the same things we care about. Isn't that interesting how that works? And we wonder why we get tired of God, why Christianity gets boring. Because we're not pursuing the God who is. We're creating God up in our own minds. I mean, seriously, have you ever wondered, or excuse me, have you ever heard anyone say things like, well, I can't believe in a God who complete the complaint. And it usually has something to do with suffering and pain. Or someone will say, my God is not like, and fill in the grievance, whatever issue we have with him. I can't believe in a God I, can, I cannot see or I cannot understand. You never want to say this out loud, but if we're honest, we believe in a God who's much more annoyed by your sins than he is by mine. (laughs) And you think about it, I mean, if God can be controlled like that, then why have one? Why not be your own? That option has been taken many times. The one true God, as Moses encountered him here in Exodus chapter 3, cannot be controlled. Moses is not in charge. He is the God who is. And we're all guilty of this more than we can actually acknowledge. But here's the deal. I don't want, I don't want to be wrong about God. I don't want to get it wrong about Jesus. And my assumption is you don't either. Regardless of where you are on the spiritual spectrum, we'd all like to think that we are right in our theology. If we're going to bank on a God being real and Jesus being who he claimed to be, then I want to make sure that I get him right as possibly as I can and avoid making him a product of my own personal preference or opinion. This is so hard to do. Nobody wants to be wrong. But are we humble enough and hungry enough and honest enough to try to get it right, to actually challenge our own assumptions about Jesus? And so that's the purpose of this series, to know more fully the Jesus we are following. So <clears throat> last fall, we skipped through the Gospel of Luke looking at the various encounters people had with Jesus. And in this series, John is the only one who does this, but in this series, we're going to skip through the Gospel of John looking at uh, the seven personal claims Jesus made of himself, the seven what we call I am statements that reveal to us in a very personal way who Jesus is. And today, before we get to those seven, we're going to look at a separate one in John chapter 8. And before we get to John chapter 8, we have to go back to Moses. Okay, so Moses starts out as a man with two countries, born to a Hebrew family, but raised in an Egyptian palace. Raised with the values of the Jewish people, but raised with all the rights and privileges of a prince. And so he lives the first 40 years of his life. His, his life conflicted who am I? Eventually, he, he kills an Egyptian slave master for abusing his Hebrew brothers and is forced to flee for his life and spends the next 40 years in a desert. A man who once had two countries now has none, and he's living in the desert for another 40 years. Fast forward, Moses is tending sheep, noticing a bush on fire not being consumed, and he says to himself, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when he had done that, when the Lord saw that he had turned aside, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, he says, here am I. And thus begins his encounter with God. God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
This phrase, I am who I am, comes from the Hebrew verb to be. God is saying, I am who I am, I am what I am. What does all of this mean? Like a fire that needs no fuel, like a bush that cannot be consumed. God is saying, I am self-existent. I am self-sufficient. I am the ground of all being. I hold all things together. In me, all things exist. I am the uncreated one, the uncaused cause. I depend on nothing. Everything depends on me. I am who I am. Now, in the Old Testament Hebrew language, it looks something like this. We'll put it on the screen. Those are the Hebrew letters. And uh, it's pronounced two different ways. When God says it, uh, it's pronounced Eya, Eya. Uh, think of Indian folk chanting, Eya. You know? Or when we say it, it's Haya. Hi, think karate, you know, Haya. Um, it's written in the imperfect tense, which means that it's, it's an incomplete action. And because of that, it can be translated many different ways. I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. I am what I am, I will be. In other words, simply, I am never not me. I am never not me. I'm unshifting and unchanging, unchangeable, immutable. What I am, I will be 24-7. Let me let you in on something. I am not that. I am not that. I can never say that about me. I am not the same person always. We say to one another, what you see is what you get. Not exactly true. For example, I'm a, I'm a nice person. Yeah, most of you, when you encounter me, you, you, you encounter a very nice person. But you ask my wife, ask my children. There is a not nice Tim in the universe. Not very seldom, but I've, my children have learned early on, if they wanted something from me, they went to their mother first and said, which dad are we going to get today? Right? I'm nice until I'm not. God is not like that. And you must understand this. This is very important to understand this about God. God is unchangeable in who he is. I am who I am. God's name is whoever I am, whatever I am. I am that always and forever. So this name transliterated into English, it's these letters on the screen, Y-H-W-H. How do you say that? Some of you might know, but don't answer that out loud. How do you pronounce uh, this name? Because in the ancient Hebrew text, you have no vowels. Uh, just consonants. And so we really don't know. Nobody knows for sure how to actually pronounce this name. 99% of scholars think it's this, Yahweh, Yahweh. Uh, We're not sure if we have the right vowels to use or not, but for hundreds of years, the really smart people have somewhat agreed that this should be that, Yahweh. Everybody say Yahweh. Yahweh. Now, in modern Western culture, in our, uh, with our old King James Version Bible, we will often find the word Jehovah, which is a little uh, unfortunate because it's Yahweh. It's, Yahweh is more accurate. But again, without the vowels, we're only left to guess. Every time Yahweh is found in the Old Testament, it is the name God is giving Moses here. I am who I am. I am that I am. 6,800 times in the Old Testament, we find the name of God, most often translated Lord in our English Bibles, in your English Bible, Yahweh is the equivalent to Lord, all capital letters, capital L-O-R-D, so that you know that this is God's name, Yahweh, in the English translation. The Lord, Yahweh. God is giving Moses his formal, personal name, saying, I will show you who I am, what I am like, You and all those following you will come to know me as the great I am. Fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus asked this question, who do people say that I am? He's not putting a finger in the air uh, so that he can go with the flow of popular opinion. He's actually in the district of Caesarea Philippi, which at the time was a hotbed for idolatry and paganism. Every god imaginable was being worshipped in that area. And so Jesus is testing the faith of his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Who do you think that I am? It's important to get me right. And Peter does. He responds, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of Yahweh, the great I am. And then again, there are several places in the Gospels where people started to get it right. Jesus warned them to keep it to themselves for the time being. 
But then we come to this passage in John chapter 8 where Jesus is not asking people who, uh, who they think he is. He begins to explain himself who he is. Now, before we get to that, again, let me explain the context. Jesus is in a heated debate with the powers that be, the scribes and the Pharisees, who have been listening to his teachings, watching his behavior, getting a bit curious and suspicious. What are you actually saying, Jesus? Why are you doing these things? What are you actually claiming about yourself? Some of them get it really wrong. They think he's a Samaritan or filled with demons. And they get into this argument about Abraham and who the offspring of Abraham is. And they say, our father is Abraham. And Jesus says, if Abraham was your father, you wouldn't be trying to kill me. Uh, but everyone who believes in me will never die. And they go, and now we, we know you're crazy because Abraham died. What are you saying here? You think you're greater than Abraham. John 8, verse 53. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? In other words, who are you? Who are you, Jesus? It's important to get Jesus right, right? And Jesus replies, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, now let's stop here again for a bit of history, about 200, 250 years before Jesus, during the time that we call the intertestamental period, the period before the Old Testament and the New Testament, Greek culture began to dominate the known civilized world. And during that time, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, was translated into the Greek language. We call it the Septuagint. Uh, And in addition, during that period, the people of God, the Jewish people, stopped saying the proper name, the personal name for God, Yahweh, out of fear of breaking the Ten Commandments. You know what that commandment was that? Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And, And in their mind, the best way not to abuse the name is just simply not to say the name. And so they just stopped saying the name for hundreds of years. And when it came to the name in the text, or when it came to the name in the conversation, instead of saying Yahweh, they just said the name. You know, the name. Yeah, got it. The name. Or they would use the word Adonai, which means master or Lord. Uh, and in our English Bibles, again, when we see the, the, the name Lord, uh, Adonai is translated with capital L, lowercase o r d, to distinguish Adonai from Yahweh. What the problem is in our English Bibles is that that it does create a bit of a disconnect in what the Bible is actually trying to tell us. And in their history, it reverted the name of God back to his title and away from his person. Remember, a title is formal and a name is personal. They stopped getting personal with God. It would be like me speaking to my wife and calling her Mrs. Hester, which I know she would love, but... Her name is Rhonda, and I think she would prefer that from me because that is the language of relationship and intimacy. She is not my wife of the pastor. She's Rhonda because I'm in relationship with her. And so when it comes to the God of the Hebrews, he is not the Lord Adonai. He is the Lord Yahweh. This is what God is saying to Moses. This is my name. This is what I want to be called by you, Yahweh, from generation to generation. This is what I want to be known of from my children. I am who I am. But wait, there's more. Back to the Greeks and the Old Testament. They come to the name, and they don't know what to do with it. How do we, how do we translate Yahweh accurately into the Greek language? Because there's no equivalent. So in the Greek, there are two words, uh, that are translated I am or I, uh, we'll put it on the screen, ego I me, ego I me. By the way, none of this is going to be on the quiz, so you're good to go to heaven, all right? Uh, but if you do need extra points with God, the, the extra credit essay might be impressive. Okay, so ego uh, is the word from which we get in the English, ego, identifying I, me, myself, I, Referring to ourselves, our basic person, personality. And I, me, also translated I or I am. So this is a combination of two words, each of which mean the same thing, but it's the best that the Greek language can do to find an equivalent to what it says in the Hebrew. Now, why am I saying all this? Because this is exactly what Jesus picks up on in in John chapter 8. He could have used one or the other of those two words, but he doesn't do that. He puts both of those words together 
and quite literally says, I am, I am. At a surface reading, it sounds like Jesus is being redundant. He doesn't have to say it twice. And in fact, in our English language, it's only translated once. But that's not what he's saying, I am. He's saying, I am, I am. And those who know their Old Testament knew exactly what Jesus was doing. Verse 58, he said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, I am. And notice their response. So they picked up stones to throw at him. They ask, who are you? And Jesus literally says, I am Yahweh. Just as God told Moses, I am that I am, he's asserting his divinity, and those who heard it had a choice at this point. If Jesus is telling the truth, then we should bow and worship. Or if Jesus is lying, we should pick up stones and stone him, because this is at the height, the ultimate blasphemy. Jesus say, people say all the time, Jesus is an awesome teacher, a great moral example, a respected figure in history, but that, you know, that I am God thing, that's something I just can't accept. Here's the deal, friends. If that God part isn't true, then none of the rest of it is true. <laughs> awesome teacher, moral example, well-respected. Oh, my word, he's a fraud. He's a liar. But if Jesus is I am, I am, then he is Yahweh. So what does this mean for us today? Let me suggest three things. Number one, the great I am desires to be known. Moses asked the question, who are you? What is the meaning of your name? Does God answer that question in that that text? No, he does not. He just promises his presence. He just promises Moses that he would not be alone. But later on in the story, at the end of the 40 years walking through the wilderness with the Israelite people, Moses is on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments, and he asks God to show him his glory, the greatness of his person, the meaning or the fulfillment of his name, and we find this in Exodus 34. What God discloses in Exodus 3, he defines in Exodus 34. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, and the Lord proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed. So this is God, Yahweh, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, it's all capital letters, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Notice back again, verse five, God himself is proclaiming his name. He passes verse six before Moses, proclaims his name, the Lord, the Lord, all caps, Yahweh, Yahweh. This is the personal name for God. This is not the universal name, Elohim, the God over all creation. This is the covenantal name of God with his people, the name by which God wants all of his children to call him, Yahweh. God is preaching about himself in these verses. The Lord, the Lord is merciful and gracious. How often? Sometimes? Most of the time? No. All the time. I am who I am. There is never a time when God is not merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, faithful. How much of the time? All of the time, friends. 24-7, God defines his own name. And because of that, these verses, Exodus 34, 6, and 7, are the most quoted verses in the Bible. This This passage is ground zero for understanding who God is. The Bible tells us that God, had, God and Moses had a unique relationship. It describes this relationship like one friend talking to another friend. And how awesome is this? We come to the New Testament where Yahweh calls us friends and reveals to us who he is. In seven unique images, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door, the good shepherd, the vine, I am the resurrection and the life, friends, the great I am desires to be known. He wants to be known by you, this God. I'll tell you, the Bible tells us that creation makes clear there is a God, that, and we are without excuse. Elohim, you cannot look at creation and not think somebody made this. But here's the thing, friends. Creation may tell us about Elohim. 
Creation cannot tell us about Yahweh. If God did not reveal himself to us, we would not know the God who is. And yet that is exactly what God has done in his written word for us, revealing to us the living or the incarnate word, which we call Jesus. Friends, God desires to be known, which leads to the second man's greatest quest is to know. Jeremiah 9, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight. He delights in the fact that we want to know him. One of the greatest barriers to faith is wanting a God who fits me rather than surrendering to the God who is. I have a truth. You have a truth. All God's children have a truth. Do you know how ridiculous that sounds? Try that with math or science or biology. And then just ask yourself, why would the God who created an ordered universe governed by exact science not be exact in his person? Why would there not be one truth about who this God is? Friends, you cannot search for the God you want. You've got to search for the God who is. And I'll tell you by personal experience, you will never got, know the God who is until he's willing to contradict you and challenge you, test your assumptions about him. You will never know the God who is until you are willing to do what he says when you don't want to do it, to do what he says when it doesn't make sense to you, to do what he says and to trust his goodness even when it doesn't seem good to you. Listen, if you read your Bible and it doesn't challenge your thinking or if you're only reading the parts that you like or even the parts that you understand, if it doesn't create challenges and frustrations and doubts and questions that you can't answer or explain, then you're not on the path to knowing God. You're on the path of creating the God that you want. Jesus is a person, a person that you can have a relationship with, and he desires to be known by you, and you can know him. He has revealed himself to us, but it's important for us to get him right. You cannot know the living word without knowing the written word. So I just want to challenge you here, my friends. Have you read it? Those of you claiming to follow Jesus, you're basing your entire destiny on who he is have you read his book? I mean, you're staking your whole life on a book you've never read or only the parts that you like or the parts that you think you understand? I want to go back to Exodus 34. We'll put it on the screen. I don't want to read it, but just think about this. Look at this as I'm talking. The nature of God, who God is as revealed in the name of God, determines the works of God. In other words, who God is is what God does. He only does who he is. Now, why do I say that? Some of you are going through a tough season right now. Things you don't understand, things that are confusing you and frustrating you and discouraging you. Some of you have gotten a no to your prayers. And some of you are questioning not only what God is doing, but who God is because of what God is doing. And listen, if the Lord, if Yahweh is saying no right now, you've got to think this through, right? If what you're going through doesn't feel good to you right now, if what you're going through doesn't seem right to you right now, since God is who he is and he does not change, if who he is is what he does, would that not mean that even if it feels not right to you right now, even if it does not look good to you right now, would that not mean that God has not, been, has not done being good to you right now, that he will work all things together for good, because he is Yahweh. Back to Exodus 3, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, and I know their sufferings. Notice three words in that verse. I have seen, I've heard, and I know. I've seen, and I've heard, and I know, friends. You got to get God right. He is not unaware. He is not unable. He is not inattentive. He is not unloving. He is not uncaring. He is merciful and gracious. And he is constantly working for the good in your life. And this is my prayer for all of us, Grace Church, that we would press into the Jesus who is, that we would follow the Jesus who is and pursue the Jesus who is, that you and I, to the best of our ability, get Jesus right. This is the greatest quest of our lives, which leads to point number three, the, gre the greater the knowledge, the greater the worship, 
Again, Exodus 34, the Lord descended in the clouds, stood with Moses, proclaimed his name, and as a result, Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Moses had 40 years in the wilderness to get the name of the Lord right through all the trials and the temptations, the disappointments. He was leading the people of Israel through the wilderness, all of that frustration, all of that anger when he wanted to quit day after day. Moses kept leaning into Yahweh, learning about this Yahweh who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. God is who he is, and who he is is what he does. And friends, that should throw all of us, all of us to the ground in worship. It all leads to worship. Friends, the more you know God, the more you will worship. I don't care what you're going through. When you encounter the great I am in your life, your life will be a life of worship. Paul says it this way in Romans 11, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given him a gift that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. 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 He is the great I am. The point of knowing God, friends, is not to fill your heads with knowledge. It is to fill your heart with wonder and worship. And that wonder expressed in worship is grounded in not what you're going through, but who God is and what God is doing in what you are going through. What has he done? He has saved you and redeemed you. He has called you by name. You are his. The most joy-centered praise and worship is rooted in who you know God to be. He is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. He is Jehovah Zetketnu, the God of righteousness. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. He is Jehovah Roi, the God who has seen our affliction and hears our cry and knows our suffering. Friends, Jesus is Jehovah. He is Jehovah Rapha, by whose stripes we are healed. He is, Jeho- he is Jehovah Jesus at canoe, by whose robe of righteousness we are covered. He is Jehovah Jireh, by whose strength we can do all things. He is Jehovah Jesus Roi, by whose meekness and tenderness identifies with our suffering. It is important to get Jesus right. Anybody want to follow him today? If you have any questions, I'd love to meet with you after, have a conversation, answer those doubts, frustrations, help you to know that Jesus who is. Would you pray with me? Father, again, thank you for revealing yourself to us. And may we, as our knowledge increase, we would increase in praise and worship and gratitude for who you are, what you are doing, and what you've done in our lives. To you be all the praise and glory. Amen.